raise your hand if I start to get too low. So I want to thank uh, the organizing committee to allow me to introduce these remarkably cool plants and some animals. And um, as a way of introducing um, the kinds of questions that my lab has been looking at for 40 years, I'd like to start with these eloquent words of Charles Darwin that he penned at the very end of the origin of species. And uh, as you'll notice, Dar Darwin actually never used the word evolution uh, in the book, but he actually did end the whole book with the active verb form evolve and only once um, in the book. And uh, basically um, my research is centered on the how, when and where these endless forms, most beautiful and wonderful uh, have um, evolved. And I use it, I answer those questions in a tree metaphor or a phylogenetics perspective as Darwin also uh, introduced in the uh, origin of species. <clears throat> My research has kind of focused on kind of four pivotal areas of this tree of life a metaphor, um, <clears throat> and you'll see it become important as we talk through this example of salvia and the sages. First, it's clear that many branches in this uh, tree of life simply have not radiated very extensively, or they have gone extinct at a higher rate than others. Others, uh, here's the flowering plant uh, branch, have actually undergone tremendous speciation relative to its sister group. And in fact, the flowering plants have done it in just a, uh, an incredible array of ecological settings. So much so that we often talk about the adaptive radiation of flowering plants. Similar, we've talked about the adaptation of cichlids or whatever. A second uh, aspect of this um, tree of life is that um, there's also interactions with uh, other branches uh, in the tree. And I'll be referring to the insects uh, here, but also later in the talk, which is the largest branch uh, in this tree of life. And in fact, estimates of species numbers of that branch today still can vary by an order of magnitude. So we really don't even know much about some of the, the tips of these branches. So species interactions with some of these other branches is important. The flowering plants haven't evolved on their own. They have interacted with other uh, parts of this tree of life. And I'll highlight two of them. One are the fungi. So fungi and flowering plants have um, co-evolved in a number of different ways um, as uh, paras parasitism, mutualisms, uh, mycorrhizal associations. And it's very clear that uh, they've impacted each other. In fact, the largest family of flowering plants, the orchids, uh, owe their success in a large part to the action of fungi. Likewise, the insects and flowering plants have had a, a major interrelationship, uh, both in terms of herbivores, uh, but also as pollinators. And, and both flowering plants and insects have uh, basically influenced the evolutionary trajectory of each other dramatically so. The third aspect of this tree of life is that traits uh, basically evolve different states through time or sets of traits through the uh, same thing. And uh, that'll become important when we talk about trait evolution. Uh, but it's pretty clear that trait evolution is a complex uh, phenomena. And uh, I wanna go through four of these, all the C words. And uh, these will be, uh, again, uh, part of the story as we'll see with uh, Selvia. Different traits can uh, often show evolutionary correlations. That is, in this case, uh, the shift to a tank forming habit in this pineapple relative, uh, and therefore the ability to capture water, a tank, uh, is correlated uh, with the shift from ground dwelling to being an epiphyte, which confers water stress. And so it's pretty clear why these two traits should be correlated. And Tom Givnish and I have shown that a number of years ago, as well as a number of other kind of correlated evolutionary uh, shifts. Convergence is, or parallel evolution of traits, that is 
the rise of specific traits in different unrelated branches is also another common phenomenon in the tree of life. Um, <clears throat> I'll say a little bit convergence often is, is viewed as the rise of the similar phenotype, but the non-homologous traits, whereas parallelisms are viewed as the, the rise of the same phenotype, but presumably through the same homologous traits. It's not clear cut. Actually, there's a gradient going on uh, in there. And, we, and it's still actually the case here. Years ago, we, we showed that the major uh, production of mustard oils or glucosinolates, defensive compounds that uh, arose, what apparently looked like in 17 different families, unrelated, actually based on the DNA, DNA evidence are all confined to one order, the mustard oil, brassicales, and in one genus of a totally unrelated order, as you can see there, Malpigiales. And it's actually still not clear whether this is convergence or parallelisms, but that's very common in the tree of life. The third feature or character is contingency, and this is another very difficult to define uh, term. Uh, historical processes such as trade evolution uh, can all also display um, some degree of what we call contingency, meaning that prior events affect the future outcome of traits, okay? Contingency, however, has been viewed differently by different evolutionary biologists. And the famous debates from 20, 30 years ago between Stephen Jay Gould and Simon Conway Morris exemplifies that kind of disagreement on what is con contingency. Contingency often involves the idea of unpredictability or unrepeatability. I prefer to see it uh, in the second definition here in a very nice paper John, by John Beatty in the Journal of Philosophy where Contingent uh, trait I'll refer to is where uh, a trait evolves only because another trait or trait state has evolved before it, okay? Um, we'll, we'll be looking at some examples in Salvia in just a second. And the last one is uh, constraint. Evolutionary constraints are, are basically limitations, biases um, on the course of adaptive evolution. Uh, the term usually describes um, the idea that there's a limit or channelization of trait uh, evolution. Um, that's probably best articulated by Gould and Lewinton already back in 1979. However, a number of evolutionary biologists view this in a more positive sense. It's not just kind of a, a negative sense, but that in fact, uh, the uh, role of barriers that might limit or channel uh, uh, this adaptive evolution might in fact open up new avenues of uh, uh, opportunities and make groups very successful in those new channeled uh, areas of trait uh, exploration. So we'll take a look at that in a little bit um, as well. A long-standing example of such constraint has been in um, plant-animal interactions in terms of pollinators. And the longstanding idea, and this goes back to Grant and Grant's seminal uh, chapter on looking at the uh, plant-pollinator inter, uh, interrelationships in the fox family, Pulmoniaceae, is that uh, the shifts that give rise to vertebrate pollination syndromes like bird or bat are basically evolutionary dead ends. Once they get there, they don't shift anywhere else. They just have to speciate within as birds or bat pollinated species and not shift to other kinds of pollinator systems, which are common with insects and other things. Now, a number of people have started to show with molecular-based approaches that this is not necessarily the case. This constraint might not be uh, a dead end. Um, in fact, Jeff Rose, a uh, former grad student of mine now postdoc, uh, showed that in this family itself, based on the DNA tree, that there are in fact multiple shifts and shifts can go to birds and bat. Although it does appear that bats might be a dead end. Uh, they tend to be very recent origins and they might not be shifting back to other types. And as you will see later, this is probably pretty relevant to what we'll be talking about uh, with the story of Selvia, the sages in the uh, neotropics. <clears throat> The fourth aspect of this tree of life is probably the most obvious. And that is that uh, species are connected by genealogical 
uh, event, descent, uh, ancestor descendant branches basically. And if evolution has occurred, uh, we assume that we can actually find uh, this evolutionary history, uncover it as one or more phylogenetic trees, okay? So the, the framework I'm talking about needs this kind of uh, tree putting together in order to talk about trait um, evolution. But I'm gonna point out that this is also a very complicated and complex endeavor. We, we assume there's a tree that Carol Darwin wrote about in The Origin of the Species in botanical lavish terms about ramifications, trunks and branches and so on. I should point out that Darwin's really a botanist. He wrote more books on botany than on animals. People don't realize that. But uh, he loved the, the, the plant metaphor. The problem, of course, is we don't have the trees. We don't have the woodiness. We don't have the trunks. So we, we have to stitch together uh, the leaves, inferring that there had to be some woody branch, branches uh, in there. And of course, the leaves of the tree, all that we're left with, maybe some extinct leaves as fossils, um, aren't nicely hanging out in space like that for us to kind of stitch things together, right? And that's because there's biogeography. Different areas of the world have clumps of unrelated or related species compounding this effort to estimate this tree. This is an estimation process. Again, it's not simple, it's an estimation process. Then of course they can diverge or they can converge and form. So it becomes a really difficult um, task. And that's why my lab has been over 40 years, basically saying we need to assess the tree on independent data, not on the characters themselves, the traits, but use something else. And we've always been using uh, DNA for that since the 1980s, basically when some of this started. And so in fact, what I'm gonna be talking about in terms of these issues of diversification, species interaction, trait evolution is in the framework of a genomic tree. So what we are using, I won't go into any more details here, except to say that we have about half the species of this genus, a luminous sequence for about 500 genes, nuclear genes in the complete chloroplast genome. And we are using that then to look at these different uh, diversification processes, species interaction and trait evolution. Now I do wanna point out, uh, we just published this, that there are disagreements between different nuclear genes. And there's some disagreement between nuclear genes and the chloroplast genome. But uh, for the purpose of what I'll be talking about, that phylogenetic uncertainty uh, basically does not change the story on what I'll be presenting today. It involves different parts uh, of the tree. Okay, so I'd like to first highlight uh, a number of features of this Selvia uh, model system. So you're uh, up to speed botanically, perhaps in terms of what's going on. Um, salvia is uh, kind of one of the mega genera of, of plants, thousand species or so. More species are being described every day, basically. Um, and they're scattered around the world. Um, they occupy Mediterranean climate, uh, grasslands, deserts, coniferous forests, broadleaf, temperate, and tropical forests. So it spans a lot of ecology. Won't go more into that. Um, if you're interested, I could talk about kind of ecological uh, evolution as well. And there's been species radiations. There's a big one in East Asia, about 100 species, a big one in the Mediterranean region itself, at least 250 species. And then a huge one in the Neotropics, at least 600 species. And uh, that'll be the group that I'll be centering in on, of course, because that's where hummingbirds are found um, as well. Second, the crown diversification of this genus uh, looks like it's in Southwest Asia. That's that yellow circle there and the node where that is. It's, it's about 31 uh, million years ago. And from Southwest uh, Asia, think of Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, that region, uh, it then dispersed to the Mediterranean regions, to Africa, Madagascar, probably multiple times, once or twice to Asia, and then back dispersal. Uh, so it's very complicated. I do want to point out, though, that there are two long distance dispersal events that went to the Americas. And they're indicated by those uh, the blue uh, numbered ones. The number two at the bottom is one just in southeastern United States into parts of Mexico. That's a separate one, totally separate 
very small number of species, to the first uh, radiation, which probably came around through Beringia, based on fossil evidence, we're pretty sure it came through Beringia and down. In fact, that's also believed how hummingbirds came into the new world uh, as well. <clears throat> and once the uh, Isthmus of Panama formed, then uh, this group centered in Mexico, southern Mexico, this continued to disperse into South America radiated and some came back into Central America. So there's a lot of them across the uh, isthmus um, as well. We also looked then uh, at uh, diversification shifts. Uh, and that is, can we find areas in the tree where there are dramatic increases in speciation relative to the background? Um, and we use a Bayesian uh, program called uh, Bayes uh, to do that. And you can see there are four shifts of, of diversification in this genus. That is the branch leading to that really has extensive um, species. Um, the largest radiation in terms of the rate is uh, the one hit by the arrow at the very top. And uh, that is the one that actually is in the neotropics. So on some of these graphs, you'll see kind of a green uh, line here. That is all this one group of neotropical uh, species. That's the biggest radiation uh, group. Selvia also has tremendous variation in um, uh, habit, secondary uh, metabolites, uh, leaf shape, size, et cetera. It's just very variable, as well as in flowers, as you can see here. And so here I want to go more into looking at flower variation and kind of the co-evolution with the, um, the pollinators. Selvia is primarily pollinated by two main groups of uh, uh, animals. First, insects, primarily bumblebees, although there's flies and other things um, as well. This is an old world uh, species of bee being pollinated. And then uh, birds, uh, primarily, obviously, just hummingbirds in the new world and in the old world, sunbirds, uh, for example, in uh, South uh, Africa. So kind of two major groups, and I'll be talking more about these later. Generally, uh, if you take a look at the flower color, pollinators usually discriminate pretty well between these. This is, uh, this is just a, a bee, a typical bee flower and a bird pollinated flower. And uh, what you see here is the RGB spectrum uh, of basically a thousand pixels. Uh, randomly taken from there and, and uh, same from the bird. And you can see the, the flower morph or the flower color morpho space, as we'll call it, are, are pretty distinct. That is, they're queuing in on uh, certainly color. Now, shown here is several hundred species of salvia where we did the same thing. But in this case, what we did was we averaged the thousand pixels, get the average pixel color, and plotted that as a species. So each little tiny dot. They're superimposed on top of each other. And you're beginning to see, that, again, there is some separation, but there's also some overlap. And I want to point that out because especially in the neotropics, as you'll see, there are some species that are pollinated by both bee and hummingbird. So the visual cue can break down here a little bit. And then the, the last major thing I need to introduce to you is this really weird thing that goes on in salvia, and only this genus in flowering plants. The best way to introduce it is it's a staminal lever, which is shown actually up here in this, so this flower. You can see it's a strictly zygomorphic flower or bilateral symmetrical flower. Uh, the top corolla is removed so you can see this weird structure called the staminal uh, lever. And um, <clears throat> it has evolved, uh, clearly I won't go through all the details, through a series of contingent steps. First of all, uh, what has happened is that in salvia, you have a reduction from five stamens, which is typical in this large cluster of families, down to four. So that's the first step. There's a reduction on to four, usually in the background of a shift from a radial symmetrical flower to a zygomorphic flower, five to four when you get a zygomorphic. So it's somewhat contingent. And then in salvia, at the, at the crown of salvia, uh, there's a shift to two stamens. So this is the filament. That the, these are the two antitheci, so two stamens. And uh, that happens in all salvia. But it also happens uh, in parallel 
and in a convergent fashion across the related genera in the same tribe. Because sometimes it's the upper two stamens that are preserved, sometimes it's the bottom two that are preserved on this shift from four to two. And then finally, which is really unique in salvia, um, <clears throat> is the production of what's called an anther connective. So bear with me here, this is a complicated structure. So typically in a stamen with the filament, these are the, these are the anthers of it. There's a few little cells that separate the two anther theci. That is called the connective, the anther connective. In salvia, what has happened is that that anther connective has just started to elongate into this own really bizarre uh, structure as shown in gray. You can see that here as well and here as well. And concurrently with that, uh, the staminal filament, the thing that protrudes the pollen bearing structure, the anther out of the flower, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. <coughs> and in fact, what you see now is the filament is that little thing right there. This is the anther uh, connective. That's an anther connective. That's the fertile uh, portion there. And in some cases, the, the bottom anther theci, the other half, uh, get sterile and sometimes fuse with the same thing from the second stamen. So they form this weird structure. It's basically a teeter totter or seesaw, a fulcrum, <laughs> the filament being the fulcrum and the anther connective being the, the long seesaw itself. And then what actually happens then in this case is that the pollinator, in this case a bee, comes in and hits that little paddle structure and then the fertile pollen bearing anthrothiki come down and deposit pollen on very specific places of the pollinator. And depending on the size of the pollinator, depending on the size, the architecture of, this, of that staminal lever, you get deposition in quite different areas. It's promoted speciation in that way. And that's why it's been called a key uh, innovation. Now we have shown that there's tremendous variation in the staminal lever across the genus Salvia. Tremendous variation. In fact, it's even more remarkable now that because based on uh, DNA evidence, we can show that there are five small genera shown with the little red asterisks that used to be called different genera altogether, like rosemary, Russian sage, not believed to be part of salvia. They're embedded in there. They're salvias, but they're, they have very slightly elongated connectives and they don't form these really elaborate staminal levers. When the staminal levers do form, it's pretty clear that there's bursts of speciation, huge numbers of speciation, okay? So this could be convergent, it could be multiple origins, which we suspect, but theoretically it could be one origin with subsequent loss of the anthropometry. It doesn't seem right though, based on the, the weird ways that some of these staminal levers have evolved. So probably convergence, um, it could be parallel. That structure um, has been implicated in really cool studies by Klaus and Bachoff and their students in Germany where they did field studies, they did mechanical studies, they looked at the fulcrum functional, how much weight is needed to do this stuff. But it's clear that the pollinators are impacting the shape of that staminal lever. You can see very curved staminal lever here for bee pollination and in this neotropical hummingbird pollination. It's basically a straight lever because the bill of the hummingbird is straight. So our first hypothesis that we want to test with uh, the data is that, uh, in fact, there is this set of correlated changes you might expect in the flower. Corolla, full of shape, the uh, connective, that weird stamina lever mechanism, and the shape of the style, the part that receives the um, pollen. Now, as we began to look at this, it became clear that in the neotropics, it looked like there were some uh, species that were pollinated by bees that might have come from a hummingbird ancestor, but they had very atypical bee floral forms. They looked like they were hummingbird flowers, but they were pollinated by bees, okay? So they didn't look like normal old world bees uh, at all. So that suggested to us that there might actually be some type of evolutionary constraint that there were shifts to bee pollination, but the, the flowers were not going into normal bee mode. They were into hummingbird mode, but being still very uh, um, uh, pollinated by bees. So we wanted to test that idea as well. 
So what did we need to do? First of all, we need the phylogenetic tree, as I indicated. And uh, what we actually did was to uh, generate a, a whole set of um, time calibrated phylogenetic trees, as I mentioned, with about 500 species. So we have about half of the species represented here. We then needed to uh, uh, basically categorize all the different species in terms of the pollinators. And then once we had that, uh, we did an ancestral state reconstruction of pollinators onto the tree. Now, I should mention that there are some that are polymorphic. They're only in here. This is a little hard to read. There's blue and red, and there's a, a few little uh, purple in there. So there are some that are doing both, look like they're being uh, visited effectively by both trees and birds. Again, the big neotropical group is this one in green right uh, here. <clears throat> It looks like depollination, as is expected, is ancestral. Those are those little blue circles uh, down here, 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 and so on. Colors are a little hard to see on the screen. Um, <clears throat> there are probably around 10 shifts to birds. Uh, it depends on the actual tree. So there's some tree variation, especially in uh, the sunbird evolution here. It could be two, three, or four. There are certainly one, maybe two shifts to hummingbirds in southeastern North America. Um, <clears throat> and there's one shift, this uh, region right here, there's one shift to the California group, or basically B, but there's one shift to um, a hummingbird. Um, but there's a single large inferred shift to hummingbirds uh, at the base of this big neotropical group. Remember that when Sylvia came into through Beringia, it's split into two groups. The California group, very small hummingbird, is uh, not very uh, prevalent there. And then this big, uh, big group of 600 species. And it has a hummingbird ancestry, pretty clear. All, all the lineages coming off are uh, effectively hummingbird. Within that big group, in the neotropics, this green group here, you can see that there are a lot of hummingbirds there, but then you starting to have back shifts to bees. And in almost all cases, they stay bee. I think one or two, depending on the tree, you might get a shift back to hummingbirds. It's basically multiple shifts back to bee. We also needed to quantify these floral traits in a very explicit um, fashion. And so what we did was using, um, um, flatbed scanners of actually whole plants, leaves, uh, flowers, flower parts. And uh, this is my co-PI in many of the grants with me, Brian Drew in the back, and my former postdoc, Ricardo Cribo, uh, where they're scanning these things with flatbed scanners. We did that in greenhouses, growing plants, in botanic gardens. And uh, we sent these little scanners around the world to the Salvia Working Group, so different countries, Algeria, Iraq, whatever, they would uh, be doing this uh, in the field um, and, and sending the uh, images uh, to us. So this is an example of what those um, flatbed scanners can do. This is now kind of what we call a species plate. And I just want to highlight the top two are bee pollinated uh, species. And you can see that with the curved uh, style and curved uh, kind of the curvature of the uh, staminal lever, this one's really curved here. As you can see, and these two are bird pollinated and they have very straight styles, female part and um, the uh, anther uh, connective. You can then take those shapes, whatever you're interested in. In this case, we're looking to look at the uh, corolla. We're gonna look at the, the anther connective and the style. So the male and the female uh, part. Basically the scan images then were landmarked. We use three landmarks, for example, for the corolla to to orientate them relative to other Corolla. And then we use the um, MOMOX package, which is an elliptical Fourier analysis. It's basically a mathematical tool to fit curves to a closed shape. It's very mathematical uh, derived. But what you can see here are the, the derived elliptic Fourier uh, outlines of several hundred species of salvia, just kind of superimposed uh, using the three landmarks, okay? So that's the elliptical Fourier uh, data is kind of, think of it as a big mathematical representation of the shape. 
You can then use principal components basically to find the, the, uh, the PCs that are uh, explaining a lot of this shape uh, variation. I'm gonna show the three that come out of this, first three. That's the mean shape, but you can see that each one of the PCs are, are capturing different parts of that uh, the different variation in shape. Um, and then you can then take uh, for each species and, and plot it. In this case, we have kind of a hypothetical morpho space in the background, the realized morpho space are the dots of individual species plotted against uh, PC1, which is that, PC2, which is that. And you can see that actually explains about 75% of the shape variation. So that's just kind of visualizing it. And you can see just for sake of uh, a visualization, what we have here is a red circle, the blue circle. Those are the 50% competence uh, ellipses for all the variation. There's some overlap, but the 50% competence ellipses are clearly different. Bird and bee pollinated uh, um, uh, corollas are different. Now, <clears throat> If you take a look, um, so first of all, birds and in terms of the corolla, but we did this for anther connective as well, style connective as well. Basically in all three, if you look at these, it's hard to see, this is green, that's green, that's green. Green are just normal bees, pollinated flowers. They're very different from bird or from the, in the new world, the bees that were derived from the bird, uh, which is right here. And in the case, that's a little bit separated here, but as you can see with anthroconnective and style, uh, all of those, the bee derived from bird, bird, and those in the new world that are polymorphic are all basically sitting on top of each other and very distinct from the other bee, which is other new world bees and other old world bee flowers. So clearly they're different. And the fact that the bee flowers from the new world derived from the hummingbird ancestor look like bird flowers in these traits suggested to us that uh, what we might in fact be seeing is this phylogenetic construct. Shifted to bird with bird features, it shifted to bees, but it has not changed its shape to a typical bee type. Now, what we need to do obviously is do this in a more phylogenetic framework, not just looking at morpho space, and so to test these hypotheses more rigorously, uh, <clears throat> we use a couple of different um, uh, Bayesian-based programs that look at uh, trait evolution on a tree. The first is using the uh, Bayesian analysis, which is really kind of a, um, uh, an ornstein uhlenbeck lasso process model developed by Cecile and A in our department in statistics. Um, that will look for across the tree shifts in the shape. And this can be any shape. You can do with animal shapes, flower shapes, whatever. We're obviously using these three characters here. <clears throat> and it'll tell you where there are dramatic shifts, big jumps in shape um, evolution. The second one is another OU uh, model, which allows you to look at, um, uh, in this case, we're using the PC1 uh, values of shape uh, variation. And you can start to vary things like uh, evolutionary rates, uh, the phenotypic optimum that it's moving to, uh, the selective uh, uh, force on it. Uh, and you can do that for different clades on the tree. And so it's a really powerful um, tool. And then finally, uh, I'll show at the very end, uh, using a, a base traits analysis where we can begin to look at correlation and contingency of binary traits, okay? You can't really do this real effectively yet with continuous traits, which we're looking at here. Okay, we, we did each one of those three separately as a univariate analysis. And we, what I'm showing you here is the multivariate analysis. So all the data of uh, all three characters were uh, simultaneously looked at. <clears throat> what you can see, it's a little bit hard to see perhaps from uh, by color, but the, what you're looking at here are different colors, that, which are different regimes that this program is finding uh, on the tree. Um, <clears throat> and basically uh, this is the, kind of the mean trait of Corolla, of anther, connective and style. And then these would be the extremes. It would be kind of bird, think of this as bird, 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 bee, 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 okay? With the mean in the middle. 
And what you're seeing uh, at uh, this node right here, this is where everything starts to turn red, this color, not that node. I'll get back to that in a second. They're all showing a big shift in these three colors at exactly the same node or same branch. I do want to point out <clears throat> that uh, there is a branch just below it that goes there. This is actually part of that neotropical group as well. So there's kind of a division at the very base. They both are primarily hummingbird uh, pollinated. This is hummingbird pollinated mainly. This is the inferred origin of hummingbird pollination. The shift happens up there, one node up, one node uh, later. But you can see it's correlated with all three of these shapes, and dramatically so with the answer, the male, and the female, etc. The corolla shape varies a little bit, and you get some kind of shifting more to B. But primarily, there's this one major shift branch that all three of these characters are um, showing. <clears throat> If you look carefully, you probably notice there's a different color down here uh, for this. This is subgenus scleria in the old world. And uh, this is a group that actually has really curved uh, staminal levers and styles. So it's a, uh, another thing, clearly designed for really exquisite bee pollination. And they go to the other uh, extreme. But again, all three of those characters uh, show a regime shift right there. So what we have shown, I think, now using the tree-based approach is that, yes, there is correlation of these traits following uh, a shift from bee to hummingbird, but also constraint. That is, as they moved to be in the neotropical group that was ancestrally uh, bird, they have largely retained these hummingbird-mediated things. So they've been constrained. But I want to point out, it's a very successful group. There are actually more bee pollinated species in that neotropical group than hummingbirds. They have just exploded, but using kind of a hummingbird ancestral set of traits and have done very well with it. So I want to end by looking at these two features I'm going to talk about in a little more detail here and end by looking at their correlative and contingent uh, features. <clears throat> these are, this is more recent work. Some of this has been published, some has not. But uh, we began to notice that uh, uh, there are two features of the stigma. Now, the style is the female part. At the very tip of the style is the stigma that receives pollen. We noticed uh, right away, and then we found out that someone in 1968 had already seen this, but it hadn't been looked at anymore, is that uh, in Salvia, there are some with the a uh, long upper lobe and a short lower lobe, whereas uh, others have a longer lower lobe or they're more symmetric. And it turns out uh, when these uh, uh, people found this, they only identified it, they did a, a superficial scan. They only found it in this neotropical group. The second feature here is a pollen or a brush. It looks like a bunch of hairs or trichomes. And that's found uh, in some of the neotropical ones as well. No one has actually looked at the distribution of these two characters since this 1968 paper. No one's looked at the function of them, nor their evolutionary trait history. So I want to explore that. But uh, as you'll see, it gives us another opportunity, along with the three traits that we really looked at, to explore what's happening down here at the bottom of this neotropical diversification. Remember, there are two clades down there. We are both uh, hummingbird ancestral. One clade has this remarkable species diversification, the largest in the genus. And it has at this node, all those three floral shifts. So clearly hummingbirds have impacted that. This clade down here is very small. There's no shifts of, of uh, these floral parts that we talked about, but yet they're primarily hummingbird pollinated. So we have to explore what's going on down here in a little bit more detail. So let's take a look first at that stigmatic uh, lobe asymmetry. Stigmas that are asymmetric with a longer upper lobe are indeed confined to the neotropics. We did a search across all thousand species. 
were only found there. And moreover, the univariate shift detection analysis showed that uh, that happens right there. One node in after the hummingbird, uh, hummingbird shift to hummingbird pollination. And uh, as you see, it is not found in that same sister group, part of that neotropical clade, which is also hummingbird pollinated and doesn't have these other traits. It doesn't have this trait as well. So we have four traits now uh, here. Now you will see that there are some shifts back from regime shifts back to kind of the background B pollinated. So there are a few things moving back, but the main shift is exactly at that same node. One node after hummingbirds uh, came on the scene in this uh, group. This is more obvious perhaps if you look at by clade. So this is the morphal space, two dimensions of the two PCs. This mustard colored uh, ellipse here are basically um, all the, what I'll call the core calisthenics. So from this node on, we call that the core calisthenics. They are very distinct from any other salvia, including that group right there in brown, which is its sister lineage in the neotropics, which is also hummingbird. So something interesting happened uh, there. Now, we further explored that by looking at uh, another uh, model, as I mentioned, which is more complex in terms of uh, looking at evolutionary change, uh, ornstein uhlenbeck model, which allows you to do kind of Brownian motion of various kinds, all the way to very complicated. And then you can test which one is actually uh, best fitting. And it turns out uh, it's this model right here by AIC scores. And, uh, <clears throat> If you, uh, in using that then and looking at the evolution trajectory of this trait, what you can see is that the, the mean shape uh, shown here of uh, B, bird, and the, the blue one here again are the bees from the New World derived from the hummingbird ancestor, and then the polymorphic ones. The polymorphic ones are basically like birds. The ones that came from the hummingbird ancestor are very similar. To the bird ones in their um, <clears throat> mean PC scores, but also in the phenotypic optimum. That is what it's trajecting uh, to. The, the B in green, normal B green from other parts of the New World or the Old World, very different kind of shape. Okay, <clears throat> what we also did then was once we knew that it was confined to the uh, New World, we actually took that longer upper lobe character as discrete. So what we did here was to take the in green is the upper longer lobe. Everything else uh, white is the lower lobe longer or equal. So simply discretized it into a binary to make it easier to do Bayes uh, traits. So as you would expect, it's it, uh, and since the character reconstruction is right there, again, it's not found in that sister lineage hummingbird pollinated. Now, when we looked at the brush, it turns out the brush, which is this um, lighter green color, also evolved at that same branch and is confined only to the uh, neotropical group. But as you can see with the transition matrix here, uh, <clears throat> there have been subsequent reversals in the new world uh, back to either brushless or to a lower, longer low. So what we wanted to do at the end then was to look at the correlative contingent nature of these two characters. So this is base traits. Let me just walk you through it uh, very quickly how that works. Base traits looks at a pair of characters, each binary. So there's four possible combinations. So what's shown on this one is <clears throat> B pollination and the, the type of lobing of the stigma. The ancestral condition we infer, of course, is that it's going to be B pollinated with a longer lower lobe. <clears throat> this is B pollinated with a longer upper lobe. This is hummingbird with a lower lobe. And this is hummingbird with a longer upper lobe. So the four different combinations. And you can basically test with Bayes traits um, statistically a number of different interesting questions. One is, how do you evolve the long upper lobe? Can you get it from a B background with a lower lobe? 
or do you get it the upper lobe from a hummingbird with a lower lobe? And it's pretty clear here uh, that transmission rate is significantly greater than zero. And uh, the only way to get the upper lobe in salvia is if you first have hummingbirds. Okay, it has to shift the hummingbirds, and then you can get the lobe. Same thing with the brush. Really, this number. <clears throat> Let me show you <clears throat> this number versus that's essentially one transition. It's very low transition rate. Effectively, this is the way you get a brush is you first have to have it in the hummingbird background to move from brushless to brush. Okay. So that's how you get those. Now, once you get those two in a hummingbird background, that is the upper lobe and the brush, then it's pretty interesting. What happens is you can get. Uh, um, Shifting to uh, B with the upper lobe from here, lots of times, and a lot of times back. Same thing here, a lot of times from a hummingbird to the B with that, that brush in, in back. And this only happens in this neotropical group, this back and forth um, transitions. Now, I do want to say there's something noteworthy about this uh, that we're still working on, and that is. <clears throat> It appears that the brush, these are correlated, but it appears that the brush is more intimately connected with that upper lobe than vice versa. That is, it's more necessary to have the upper longer lobe to have a brush than uh, the reverse. So just an example, if you look at the bottom here, this is a little hard to read maybe, but there are 48 species that have hummingbirds in the brush. If you look at those 48, 47 of those species also have the upper lobe. Only one doesn't have the longer upper lobe. It's pretty tight. And the same is true then when you look at the bee and the brush. Of the 137 species that have that, all except one have the longer upper lobe. If you're gonna have a brush, you need an upper lobe, longer upper lobe. That is not the case with the upper lobe. With the upper lobe, you know, there's the 77 species that are upper lobe and hummingbird, but there's actually 30 of them that don't have the brush. And likewise, if you look at the bee and the long upper brush, uh, 29 of the 155 don't have the brush. So it's not as tight. So we have demonstrated, uh, I think, a strong correlation between um, the evolution of the longer upper lobe and the brush um, in the node right behind uh, hummingbird pollination. And that there's been lots of them shiftings back and forth between um, with bee pollination. The functions of that upper lobe, you might be asking, and the brush really have not been studied in salvia. And uh, I'll just present two working hypotheses here that we're looking at with experimental data in the field. The first is that, and you can see the upper lobe uh, actually right there. You can see that, that's the lower lobe. This is probably the receptive part of the stigma. This upper lobe appears to act as a hinge underneath the corolla to kind of keep everything in place. And that makes sense in terms of hummingbird flowers. They have very long, skinny styles. And having that little hinge just stabilizes that style and presents that. Uh, uh, receptive area of the stigma to allow for really greater precision of pollen take up. So we think it has to do with precision of pollen uh, um, <clears throat> receptivity there. The brush uh, is, and you can see the brush here. The brush is, you can see this sometimes. We've got plants in the greenhouse, so I'll look at them, I have a brush. You will often find pollen grains on that brush. And that's a well-known phenomenon in plants in general. There's a pollen brush, but it's considered secondary pollen presentation. It holds the pollen, not just in the stamens, but then they also hold it for a while longer in these little brushes. And it looks like that brush is acting as a secondary pollen presentation to enhance the length of pollen deposition onto either hummingbirds or bees. So in conclusion, I've demonstrated five 
different traits where they all appear to have correlated evolution on one node uh, soon after the origin of hummingbird pollination in the neotropics. The shift to neotropical hummingbird pollination from B around 20 million years ago seems to have set up this uh, series of events with drastic changes in whole sets of floral features. The corolla, male parts, female parts, um, allowed for a dramatic, one of the most dramatic radiations in the neotropics is this group of, of stelvia. But keep in mind that uh, it wasn't at the expense of bees. Bees co-opted this as well, even though they're using hummingbird floral traits and have themselves diversified tremendously. So thank you. I do want to acknowledge uh, some of the people working with me. Of course, Brian Drew, University of Nebraska Kearney, uh, who's been my co-PI in a couple of grants, postdocs, Ricardo Kribel, who I showed, Jeff uh, Rose is a postdoc on this grant as well. Two graduate students who worked on a lot of the DNA work. Alexa is still in my lab. Chloe is now an assistant professor elsewhere. And then a number of undergraduates in two of these that were on some of our publications. Lucy is actually a graduate student now in Ken Kiefelbers or in Bonn. And then a whole host of visiting scientists. We couldn't do this project without actually the Selvia working group, this faceless group of people all over the, the world who provided material, scans, and our, our co authors uh, with us. But a couple of them came to our lab as um, well. So I acknowledge the funding as well from various different sources. But thank you.